Hello, this is Dennis Polis with another Open Philosophy video. In this video we will be continuing our discussion of knowledge. Last time we discussed knowledge as a human experience and in this video we will be discussing knowledge as a relationship. In every instance of knowledge there is a knowing subject and a known object. If no one knows, there is no knowledge, and if nothing is known, again, there is no knowledge. So there is no instance of knowledge which is not a subject-object relationship. In every case, knowledge is both subjective and objective. To think that knowledge is only objective is to forget that it is a human experience. To think that it is merely subjective is to forget that in every instance when we know, we know something. We know something of the world, but what we know is only a little of what the world has to tell us. It is what I call a projection. It's partial. We understand from this perspective, but not from that perspective. We understand using this sense, perhaps, but not that sense. We grasp this about it, but we don't grasp that. The object continues to remain mysterious and able to surprise us with new knowledge at any time. Imagine the most objective form of knowledge that you can think of. Perhaps it's objective news reporting, or perhaps it's scientific knowledge. But in news reporting, no matter how objective, no matter how balanced, editors and reporters have to choose to cover this aspect of the story and not that. They have to choose where to place the story within the context of the news program, or on their website, or in the paper, and they may choose not to cover a particular story at all. All of these are subjective choices and limitations of knowledge. They reflect the values and interests of the editors and reporters. In the same way, if you think of science as the paradigm of objectivity, what is studied is what the experimenter or the theorist finds interesting or perhaps within their ability to study. Again, this is subjective, reflecting their values, their interests, and, of course, their capabilities. In every instance, no matter how objective, subjectivity affects what we know and limits it to a particular projection of reality. There's a tendency to think of objects as being in the external world and our objective information to be about the external world. But in fact, in every experience, there's information both about what we are primarily looking at, such as a bird, and ourself. Thus, every experience has two objects. The primary object, which we can call the objective object, and a secondary object, which is ourself, which we can call the subjective object. What do I mean? I mean that in seeing a bird, we know that we can see, so we have information on our visual capabilities. We also know that we can be aware. Thus, in every experience, we come to know not only the world, but ourselves as experiencing it and as capable of experiencing it. Now let's consider a couple of standard objections to the objectivity of our knowledge. One objection to the objectivity of our knowledge was brought by John Locke. Locke said that we can only know our ideas. Of course, Locke is very confused on this point. Our ideas are not what we normally know. What we normally know are objects and our ideas are the means by which we know. Think of an apple. When you think of an apple, you're not thinking of an idea. You're thinking of something beyond yourself, beyond your ideas, something in the outside world. It is only on reflection that you see that there is some means by which you know the apple and call that means an idea, the idea of an apple. So it's not the idea that we know in the first instance, but the apple. And so John Locke is simply wrong in saying that we only know our ideas. 
Immanuel Kant also objected that we don't know reality. According to Kant, we know only the world of phenomena, the world of experience, and we do not know, and cannot know, the noumenal world, the true world, which lies behind it. Kant was motivated by a misunderstanding of the nature of causality. Kant wanted to believe that time-sequenced causality, otherwise known as accidental causality, was necessary, whereas philosophers going back to Aristotle knew that it wasn't necessary. And David Hume pointed this out with very cogent arguments. Kant was unwilling to accept Hume's arguments that causality is not necessary because Kant did not have a very good background in metaphysics. He didn't understand the difference between concurrent or essential causality and accidental causality. Kant's is a totally ridiculous objection. Why? Because if we can't know the noumenal world, we have absolutely no reason to posit its existence. When we speak of reality, we mean what we experience. There is no other basis for us to speak of reality than our own experience of reality. So to say that we don't know reality is to say that we don't experience what we experience. And that is totally absurd. While what we've been discussing is fairly obvious, the next aspect of the relationship of subject and object is anything but obvious, namely their identity. The identity stems from the fact that the object being known by the knower is identically the knower knowing the object. There is only one action, the action of the subject knowing the object. But there are two ways of thinking about it, two ways of formulating it in words. We can formulate it by fixing on the object and then we say the object is known by the subject or by fixing on the subject and then we say the subject knows the object. But these two things are identical. So there's an identity here of knower and known. The object is intelligible. It can be understood. But it is not actually understood until a knower knows it. And a knower has the ability to understand, but he doesn't understand something concrete until he encounters the object and understands it. So one action, namely the act of understanding, the act of awareness, is the completion of both potentials. The intelligible, the knower, becomes known in the act of knowing, and the knower, able to know, actually knows in the same act of knowing. Of course the identity is not complete. There's only an identity with one aspect of the object, with the aspect that we've become aware of. Other aspects remain mysterious. So again, we know only a projection of the object, only one aspect among many, or a few aspects among many, and the mystery remains.